And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallace in Podcast. Brought to you by ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease, ETP Canada. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion, Tom's Place will suit you. And now, here's Ted. Thanks so much, Becky, and welcome everybody to another episode and another edition of the Ted Wallace Show Podcast. Thank you for taking the time to spend some time with us. And if you get a chance, pass along the information about our show to your friends. You can find us at www.tedwallishin.ca or pretty much anywhere where you find uh, your pod, your favorite podcasts. You can get us there, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those places. Marla Lukowski is back again this week with us. She's a great guest to have because she is so many different things. She's a comedian, she's a singer, she's a voice artist, and a cancer survivor. And we're going to talk about that as well because we're in the month of October now, and it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So uh, thrilled to have her back with us. How are you, Marla? I'm great. How are you, Ted? I'm very well, thank you. I I read a fabulous piece that you posted uh, on Facebook the other day about uh, coming out in front of uh, your congregation at the temple. And I thought to myself, wow, it was riveting. And I thought to myself, how ballsy that must have been. Was that like a last minute decision? How did that come about? It was really last minute. In fact, when I saw that the um, discussion group that the rabbi sometimes conducts during the intermission, they call it, because it's a a 12-hour service of Yom Kippur. It's so long. Um, When I saw the title, Judaism and Homosexuality, I thought, I'm not going. I can only imagine. So I came at the time that it was supposed to be over. And when I came, there was about 75 people out of, you know, 1,000. They were still talking, and I heard some comments, and I thought, oh, my God. But I sat at the back, and what I heard was so disturbing to me that I knew I'm going to say something before I leave because if I don't, I will truly never be able to look at myself in the mirror again because it was homophobic, as it is in many houses of worship in many religions. And I thought, I can't. And here's a congregation that I grew up with that my parents helped start, and nobody knew I was gay except the rabbi and my parents. And, uh, like I said, when I had to stand up and say, how did the rabbi know? I'm, 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 first of all, I'm fascinated. Well, I told that, him. Okay. I'm fascinated that you told your parents before you told your friends. Cause I know usually from what I understand, um, from what I've heard from my gay friends who've told me that it's been mm-hmm. the other way around. It is the other way around for 99% of the population, but I've always had a very honest and open relationship with my parents, whether they agree with me or not, because if you, I believe if you really love your parents, you'll be honest. And if your parents really love you, they will accept you and love you, even if they don't agree. Mm. And so when people said, aren't you worried that your parents might stop loving you? And my answer is, if they stopped loving me, in quotes, then they really didn't love me. If that's the reason that they stopped loving me, then they should be worried. That's what I'm baffled by. Gay people should be not worried how their parents accept them, but the parents should be worried of how the kids will accept them. And and to me, if if the parents say they don't, then they're the ones that are losing out. Exactly. Not you. I mean, as a parent, um, I have two kids, neither of them are gay, and if either of them were, I wouldn't love them any less or any more. It wouldn't make a difference to me. My only concern would be, are you happy? Are you happy? Are you healthy? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's what my parents said to me. Well, we've always said we want you to be happy. Are you happy? And I said, well, right now my heart is hurt, but I'm so happy I know who I am. And that is being true to myself. And it was very peaceful to know why I felt so different when I was dating men. I didn't feel like what these stories and poems and my other heterosexual friends were saying. I just didn't feel that way. So now I knew why. Yeah. 
And, and when you told your rabbi, how did he re respond? Oh, he was so cool. Um, he is a very uh, diversified rabbi when it comes to different communities that he immerses himself with. So he's he visits all sorts of communities and partakes in services from gays to trans to everything. And that's what caught my eye about him, even though he was the new rabbi at the time at this synagogue that uh, was newly that it was called the little shul that could because it was a small <laughs> congregation that started to make the news kind of because of him actually rabbi mm -hmm. yossi uh, because he was groundbreaking and i see i had come back from los angeles and los angeles was a very um gay mecca it, yeah. it was like going to israel and being jewish i just felt so comfortable there and when i came back um i told him and because it was a, a no no brainer for me with everybody, and so he was like, "Hey, cool, that's great." And so I, I'm wondering, and I never asked him, "Why did you pick that subject? Like, what did you think would happen?" Because it wasn't a good scene, and it was really life changing for everybody in that room when I stood up and said, "You know," when he said, "Is there anybody else who would like to say something?" Yes, Marla. He was yeah. probably really happy I put my arm up. And when I stood up, I said, my name is Marla Lakofsky. You've known me since I was a little girl. My parents were the founding members of the synagogue, and I am gay. And I said, if there's any sound in the dictionary for 75 heads swishing around to stare at me, that's the word to describe it, because that's what happened. And yeah. I said, yes, that's right. I wonder how many of you still like me who liked me before you know is and that what happens yeah it you know it it, it reminds me of an old uh, george carlin routine where he talks about long hair mm. and he said how eventually things change to the point where uh he said some long hair guy would walk in if you had long hair you'd walk in, into a restaurant there'd be a group of uh, older women sitting around and they go i have a nephew who's got hair just like that his, right. and, and his point was that he was being accept, accepted because somebody there at the table had a relative who also had long hair. And it's the same thing. Well, I got a relative who's gay. And so you've accepted that relative. So now you're going to accept the whole concept. Right. As opposed to easy rider. So if somebody had long hair, you were in trouble. Yeah. Now, and, and after you, 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 you spoke, all these people started coming up to you and, and many were were very positive about what you'd said and 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 your lifestyle they were not condescending face to face because that takes guts and people usually who have, have hatred towards other groups don't have guts they just have hatred that's right and so i said my piece i responded to every negative comment that was said during the discussion and i addressed every one of them when i was speaking and then when i sat down you know, my heart was pounding, my hands were shaking, and I thought, holy shit, what the yeah, hell yeah. is going to happen now? <laughs> but whatever it is, I'm going to face that too. And then I saw, I thought they were all going to the washroom, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they stopped at my chair, and I looked up. I was wiping my eyes because I got teary-eyed talking. Uh, but I, you know, held my own because I'm a professional. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. uh, every one of them I, I stood up and they put their hand out. So I took their hand and many of them said the same thing. My name is Paul and I'm so proud to meet you. My name is Susan and I've never heard anything so powerful in my life. My name is Sid Chapnick. I liked you before and I like you even more now. That was that man. He's now deceased. Yeah. And, and it was one after the other. And it was like, wow, okay. Even if they didn't like me, I'd be okay with what I did. But there were so many people. And the fact that they lined up to shake my hand, give me a hug, really showed those five people who spoke out against homosexuality something, didn't it? It showed them. Yeah. There's other people there who weren't brave enough to say something, but they were now to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and if they were all honest, if you asked, them, okay, how many of you have a relative mm -hmm. who is gay? You'd probably see a lot more hands pop up than you might imagine. 
absolutely. And they're still closeted. And actually one person did confess to me, but nobody knew that they were gay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one day this will all be a non-starter and it won't even be a story to be told. That's what I hope for. You know, some people criticize me. Are you going to post another thing about being gay and how many countries in Africa and Asia and Europe and the Arab countries ban homosexuals? I said, yeah, because one day I hope I never have to post about that. That's right. That's my answer. That's right. Good for you. Yep. That's the deal. It's, it's the same thing with, with interracial gay, uh, interracial couples, like yes. gay couples, right? Yes. It's it used to be a thing, and now it's like every other commercial on television features a gay couple or a black man with a white woman or a, an oriental woman with a an Asian woman. You can't say oriental anymore, by the way. It's All right. Asian now. Right, I get corrected all the time for many things like handicapped, you can't say, and I still say it, and uh, uh, please forgive me. Yes. yes, well, you know, the Supreme Court judge, Clarence Thomas, is in a, a you know, a, what they call mixed marriage of, a, a, he has a white wife and he's a black man, and yet he's against homosexuals having rights. And so, right, do we cut back to 50 years where it was illegal in half the states of the country to be in a mixed marriage? Um, yeah. And now he's free to do that, but he's denying the equal rights to other groups who only want to love somebody just like he loves his wife, or I assume he does. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it, hip, hip, the hypocrisy is, is just nauseating at times, isn't it? It's rampant, yes. Mind, mind you, a lot of what's going on in the States right now is just, uh, it's just too bizarre sometimes. I follow this. I, I got to a point where I stopped following the whole Trump thing, because I just, it just got so annoying listening to people battling each other left and right, left and right, left and right. And then it started getting funny and, and, and really bizarre again. And to, to listen to some of the things that he claims that he's done and that he said, and, and I think to myself, does he really believe this? <laughs> I'm laughing because it's, it's so true. I mean, well, and his followers, I like, do you, do you read books? Do you, I mean, and hey, there's fake books out there too, but there's some things you've got to know you're regurgitating that don't even make sense. I know. Exactly. Exactly. But I have to say, uh, now being an American citizen as well, because as troubled as that country is, uh, I'm still a fan of it because the sky's the limit. And when it comes to Canada, and I'm a fan of this country too, having been born and bred here, um, we have wonderful things, but we have some similar problems that America does. We just don't get the press or coverage because those protests I saw at Queen's Park the other day, uh, protesting that gay, the, the subject of gay and alternative and literature and stuff should be out of the schools and, you know, we're poisoning their children. It's all about the children. Yeah, um, I, I was shocked to see how many visible minorities were protesting against gays. And I was thinking, well, here we are again, hypocrisy. Uh, weren't you just complaining a couple of decades ago about your own safety and security and exposure, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we have it here, too, and out west, you know, and, and um, the prairies and stuff. It's not yep. the biggest pro-gay area, having toured across the country. It's not the biggest. The big cities are safest. Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. But, you know, other than that, it's the same problem of the, the west in, in America is also more liberal as it is in Canada. And something happens in the middle where... The farms are, I don't know what happens, but people don't like people who don't look like them. Yeah. Generally speaking, of course, please don't send me letters. <laughs> uh, that, that, that speech that you made, that story that you told, I mean, we're only sort of scratching the, uh, the base of, uh, we're just scratching the top of it here. It, 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 it's some, it needs to be read. People, I guess, if, if they follow you on Facebook, they can see it because it's there. Yeah, but I, I wish, and you know, the New York Times uh, had sent out a, a message to people, if you have a short story and it has to be so many words, 
Uh, we'd like to hear it. And so somebody had written me, said, I read your story. You've got to submit this. It's such a powerful story. It could change people's lives. And I agreed. So I sent it to them. But they wrote back, has this ever been on social media? And I had to say, yes, it was on Facebook on my, my, you know, under my name. Um, and, and I mean, I can tell you how many people saw it out of the world. And they said, oh, I'm sorry, it's disqualified. I said, but I'm telling you, and I pleaded with them, this story can change people's lives. It might save somebody's life. It might save a family from falling apart. Please consider it. And I never heard back from them. But I still think this story, and I agree with you, should be read maybe even publicly or a TED Talk, uh, if I could memorize something for 18 minutes, ha ha. But I, I hear you can have teleprompters. Um, it could reach out and really yeah. help people. Because it, yeah. it's an important story that can be applicable to many subjects. Now, some things that I, I don't understand, for example, like this, this whole concept of, of pronouns. <laughs> yes. And, and it's, it's causing so much uh, debate. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I see people now on, on Facebook or on Twitter and, and, you know, and they've got he, she. And, and, I, and I wonder to myself, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the value? What's the importance in this? Can well, you explain uh, this to me? Yes, I'm going to try. Um, I just want to let you know that my pronoun is it. <laughs> it. It. That's it. it. Wasn't, that, was, it. wasn't that a cousin in the Adams family? Cousin <laughs> it? It was, and I've taken over with okay. shorter hair. Yeah. Um, you know, we used to have a saying, believe you me. Yeah. You know, believe me. Now you have to say, believe you me, he, she, we, they. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and 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 the um, the gay community, I mean, I still use the word gay, but it's, it's every letter in the alphabet. And I said, you know what, soon it, the label is going to be so long because it used to be LGBT. Yeah. And now, it, then it was LGBTQ. And then it was LGBTQ2. And, and, and now there's even more letters. And, and, what's, and what's the two stand for? I don't I think it's two spirit. You know, oh. you're, you're making me look dumb here. I, no, no, I, I, I think I just, it's the, <laughs> I should have looked it up because I thought he's never going to ask me that. That's the yeah, only I, thing I didn't write down. Oh, no. I think it's in the um, Native Indian community, two spirit, okay. uh, because, you know, a lot of people are of two sexes inside themselves. You know, men don't want to admit that they've got a strong uh, feminine side and, and women don't want to admit. Well, they usually do want to admit, I'm as strong as you. What the hell are you talking about? Close yeah. that door. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I th I think I think I think it should be LGBTQ. You get the idea. That's what the acronym should be. That's LGBTQ. Right. Yeah, yeah. You get the idea. Because yeah. where, when are the letters gonna stop? And boy, am I gonna get mail about that comment. But yeah. No, but it's true. It, it, it's true because I remember it, it, at one point it was just LGBT and yeah. then Q and then two. I think there's some more letters in there. There, there is. Missing, there are. Out as well. Yeah. We'll have to look <laughs> it up, but. I don't want to move my papers, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, how you been, uh, your, how's your health doing, by the way? Because we're into October now, and this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, something that you're more than aware of, something that you experienced twice, right? Yep, I, I did, sadly. And not a lot of people know about the second one, because I didn't let it be known right away. I was kind of you know, I, I want to say I was in shock, but I wasn't in shock, just like I wasn't the first time. I was, I'm just such a pragmatic person. And, you know, when they said, well, there's something, um, we need to set up a biopsy, we'll call you in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, I didn't even take down a phone number. And then I didn't hear from them. And I was like, oh my God. Um, so yeah, about I think about a year later, I finally posted on Facebook, just to let you know, <laughs> nobody was out there, you know, uh, uh, I had a recurrence a and yet it may not have been a recurrence, but maybe just a second bout of it in the same breast with the same characteristics, uh, with the same size, everything was the same. So uh, the first bout that I had was in 1998 and I had it when I was living in Los Angeles and I happened to have bought health insurance in a very good package. It's called a PPO, preferred patient. Oh, I don't know, but maybe it's like, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I got to pick whoever I wanted and the speed of treatment was very fast and I got into the doctor's offices and I really lucked out with excellent doctors who were so personable and who gave me the time in the appointment, not 15 minutes like they do here. And I just had such a level of high care treatment that it really makes me look at the Canadian treatment in a different way. And and I'm happy to discuss some of the differences here, but that I, I would say that me having to live in Los Angeles at the time could have saved my life because my mammogram was negative. Mm. So if you have cancer, why is it negative? And that's a great question because mammograms are not foolproof. They do not catch everything. And if you have dense breasts, which many people do, and it's not abnormal to, but the more dense your breasts, the harder it is to read what's there with a mammogram. And so that's why I now get an ultrasound with my mammogram. And I always suggest that women ask for that, even though the system doesn't want to pay for it. And you should always offer to pay for it yourself. And then the system here will say, we're not, we're not set up for payments. Well, then we start to be, we have to change something about that. Yeah. Um, having said that, uh, I spoke to my oncologist in Los Angeles when it, uh, when I had the recurrence in 2019. And he said, just want to let you know that a law is being passed in California and there will be uh, going through the states, many of the states, not Mississippi right now. It's not going to consider it. There was three states that didn't want to, Arkansas, Kansas, and Mississippi. I was like, oh God. Anyways, that it's required. If you have a certain level of dense breasts, you must have a second test with your mammogram. You must have an ultrasound or an MRI. I personally like ultrasounds because in the first time there was nothing there. I was lucky enough to find the lump myself in, I was just taking out the garbage. My, my zucchini breast slipped out of my underwear. I grabbed it and I felt this lump. Okay. You need to know the details. Thanks for asking. So, um, which means, yes, I have a long breast. Yes, I do. So, um, I found it myself and so did 90% of the women in my support group in Los Angeles at the time. So I was shocked when the Canadian cancer society recommended you don't have to examine yourself anymore. And I thought that's wrong. I think you should once a month. And, and I think your GP should uh, examine your breasts annually as they should be seeing you. Now the question is, can you get a GP in yeah. Ontario or Canada right now? That's the other hurdle there. But if you have one, ask them to check it. But the thing is you have to be familiar with your own breasts and you have to like, Get really intimate with them. You know, take them out for dinner, order their favorite wine, whatever they want, you know. Put on a good rom-com for them. <laughs> Absolutely. Honey, yeah. do you want dessert with that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then you get to know, oh, are you lumpy there? Because I'm cystic, so I have a lump here and there. And so it's like me. It's like, please, doctor, you feel my breasts because you have a more skilled set of hands. Um, it just by happened to feel that lump at the time because I was doing an activity and, you know, had to grab my breast and put it back into the shirt. And, oh, what's that odd lump there? Now, here's the thing. I had that odd lump. I called my GP in Los Angeles. He said, come right in. Wow. You think that's going to happen in Toronto? I don't know. It doesn't never happens to me. And so I came in and he felt it. And I said, it's probably a lymph node, huh? And he said, no, no, it's not a lymph node. Uh, why don't you get a mammogram and go back to Cedar Sinai? I said, I just had one like last month. He said, I don't care. Now, can you imagine, you know, most doctors would say, well, you, you already had that test and it said there's nothing. So go home and don't worry about it. But he said, go back. And when I went back, they did another mammogram. And they said, there's nothing there. Mm. And they said, but here's the thing. And I was lucky enough that I had a palpable lump. Can you imagine the people? And my second one was not palpable. So if the mammal missed it, it would have kept growing. And that's how you get a later stage diagnosis. Right. So 
at the beginning, the memo was negative, but I had such a skilled technician who was also a teacher there teaching everybody. She said, don't go home. I want to get you an ultrasound immediately. Hold on. And she got Mm. me an emergency ultrasound. And they said, it's right there, right there. A doctor came in. He said, you need a biopsy. I'd like to send you uh, to somebody. Do you have any idea? And I said, yeah, I've got this name, uh, Dr. Adeshak. And he said, I'll, I'll call him right away. He's excellent. I got the appointment in a couple of days. I went there. He said, yep. And we do the biopsy um, with a local anesthetic. Excellent. And they didn't have the needle core biopsies then. Uh, but he said, you can do a biopsy, actually, sorry. He can do a biopsy, we can monitor it, or we can remove the lump. I do all three with a local anesthetic. What would you like? And I said, I want the lump removed. Now, here's the good news. When he removed the lump, he said, good thing you did, because if you did the needle biopsy, half of the lump was benign, but the other half was malignant. Wow. So good for you. And this small, small lump that was at the time less than one centimeter had already spread to the lymph nodes, which is less than 3%. And that's my middle name, Marla, less than 3% Lukowski. <laughs> so those things can happen. So yeah, so here, you know, people talk about the expense of, of Americans, the, the, the money that Americans spend on health care. And, and it can get extremely expensive. Yes. If you don't have a good health care plan, that's for right. sure. And right. sadly, some people can't afford a health care plan at all. all. Right. Um, but but and they here, do have Medicare that if, you, if yeah. you earn very little, you get actually pretty good medical care. With, with It's either Medicaid or Medicare or something like that. But you have to learn earn a certain, you know, amount that's yeah, under what max. most people want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and yet, yet we think that uh, here we've got this greatest healthcare system, and it's and it's free. Well, first of all, not everything is free in healthcare. There are a lot of medications, and there are a lot of procedures that you have to pay for in in our healthcare system that people may not be aware of, but they do exist. And you don't get things like go for another test because of money. It really, when you think about it, it's all boiling down to money. Yes. Absolutely, our, yeah. It's like, well, you had one test, that's good enough. That's Even though exact, the doctor, yeah. and, and you ask the doctor, okay, if it was your breast, would you go for another test? <laughs> so I used to say, if it, if I was your sister, but now they say, you mean my mother, you know, because yeah, yeah. I've gotten older. <laughs> I said, shut up. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Yeah. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. It's when you get cataract surgery and OHIP pays for the bottom of the line lens. But if you want the good lens so you could see, um, yeah. we have to pay extra. Well, pay extra, folks. Pay extra because uh, um, OHIP is not covering for certain things to see your optometrist or your ophthalmologist. And I say to people, it's your eyes, folks. Did you buy a coffee at Starbucks? Stop doing that for a month and you can pay for this, you know? Yeah. Like, I think people complain here too much whenever they have to pay. And you have to think about what are you spending your money on that's more important than your health and your longevity? Yeah. And so, okay, I want to say something that's really important about cancer. And it's, and it may be, I don't know, I may be really out of line, but the way I see it and having been through it twice and seeing two different systems of medicine, I don't understand why anybody would die of breast cancer in this day and age if, and I qualify if, there's early detection. And you get early detection by having regular mammograms and ultrasounds or and MRIs, and you have good machines, and you have good technicians, and you have good physicians. All three areas need to be good, or you may have a misdiagnosis missing the early detection. So this is key. Now, the question is, what does the Canadian Cancer Society recommend? Well, they recommend that you start at the age of 50 and you can have it up until the age of 74. So I'm going to ask, doesn't anybody get breast cancer or die in their 30s and 40s? Well, the answer is yes, they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And don't 
don't women or men die or get breast cancer after 74? So you hit 75 and you don't qualify. Yes, they do get it. And yes, they do die. So I don't understand that at all. You compare that to the American Cancer Society and it's totally different. They believe in starting at the age of 40. Well, you know, one day they'll do it at 30. And and if you feel uncomfortable getting the radiation and they're reducing the radiation by the more digital machines, et cetera, et cetera. It's a small amount when you consider how much we're putting our phones near our ears and our TV and everything. Um, But to save your life, sure, why not? Uh, Instead of prophylactic surgery where you remove your breasts and your ovaries and your uterus, just in case you're genetically, um, you know, prone to something, but there's never a guarantee genetically. But the American Cancer Society, bottom line, starts at 40 and you can go up. Now, here they say every two years, unless you're high risk. So I'm lucky I'm high risk. Oh, good. I had it twice. I'm high risk. So I get it every year and I get both tests every year. I'm lucky but I'd rather not be lucky and still have that protocol of every year and two tests. So we can catch it because Ted, how do you know you're high risk unless it's caught and how do you catch it unless you have the tests? So it's mind boggling. So in the States, they start earlier and they do it every year. And at the age of 55, you have the option to do it every year or every two years. And that's a better approach. And they insist that if your dense uh, breasts, that is not stupid, um, that you definitely get a second test automatically. And they're making it law that when you have your mammogram on the report, it has to write down your density level. And the categories are A, B, C, and D. D being the most dense, C being less, and A and B being even more or less. So uh, the way it is here, or at least in the States, if you're C, you, it has to be written down and you have to have a second test. And I, I was reading articles and I knew that I was always told I was dense breast in the States. Um, I came back here and I recently had a um, disagreement with a doctor. I won't name the hospital and I won't name the doctor. Um, but uh, she was saying, I don't think you need a second test. And I said, well, I was told I have dense breasts. Well, I don't think it's a that, that test. Let me see that thing. And she looks at the computer and she finally sees something and she goes, well, it's not that dense. So I go home and I mm-hmm. look at my test result, uh, the scan, the professional scan. And it says right there, level C density. Well, level C is required second test. That's called uh, heterogeneously dense. That's a very dense breast that must have a second test because the mammal will not find everything for sure. Yeah. These are things I wanted to tell your audience. These things are really important. They are. And I'm glad you are. I'm glad you're sharing them with us. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you, through, through all of this, you still manage to keep, you maintain your sense of humor. Uh, Cause I got to think that that was a big support for you having that sense of humor going through all those tests, dealing with all those different doctors, having all those conversations. Well, I do have an innate sense of humor. Uh, I'm not one of those people who, and they must, I don't I find them very annoying that, you know, <laughs> you know, their family just got, you know, I don't know, shot down at a bank and they go, oh, well, you know, there's less people to cook for. I'm not one of those people, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, I can't make a joke about it. I would be in shock and horrified and stuff, but there's funny things that happen that I can see as having an innate sense of humor. There's funny things that happen. And in fact, I, um, we have a clip that we can use uh, from my show. I'm still here. And so is my hair. And let me just say, having lived longer than expected and having still the ability to do my one woman show, it has been retitled. I'm still here. And so is my hair, but now it's growing on my chin. (laughs) And so the clip uh, gives just one example of where there's humor in having cancer. And I know it sounds strange, but there actually is. Of course, there's trauma and there's sorrow and it's hard. It's damn hard to go through treatments, that is. Um, But uh, there are moments of humor. And and if you can feel like you want to laugh, laugh. And if you need to cry, you cry. Let's listen in. So I had to go see an oncologist. I saw a wonderful man by the name of Robert Decker. And 
He sat me down. He said, Marla, you've got aggressive cancer cells going, even though it's early. We have to give you aggressive chemo. We're going to give you cytoxin and adriamycin. There's some side effects. Got to tell you what they are. Some of them might happen. Some of them will happen. I said, okay, go ahead. Tell me what they are. He said, well, you will go into chemically induced menopause. You might become sterile. You will lose your hair. You might get mouth sores, anal sores, bleeding gums, bleeding nose. Your white cell count will drop. You might get infections. You will gain weight. You might get leukemia or uterine cancer, and you may have permanent heart damage. Well, I was astounded. Wait, wait, doc, back up a bit. Did you say I was going to gain weight? <laughs> Ted Walshin returns in a moment. Hey, it's Ted Wallace and for Tom's Place. Our fall merchandise is starting to arrive, and we've got massive amounts of summer clothing that needs to be cleared. Blowout prices on virtually everything, like designer suits, regularly up to $5.99, now from $167 to $267. Beautiful sports jackets, starting at only $167, and designer dress pants and shirts, all at $67. Check out our deals throughout the store on the very best of designer menswear. Huge savings off our already below retail prices. If you need a suit for an upcoming wedding or any special occasion, we are Toronto's one-stop suit shop. For the finest outfit for every occasion, there is no better time to find the perfect addition to your wardrobe. Tom's Place is open daily, 11 to 6 weekdays, 10 to 5 Saturday, and 12 to 5 on Sunday. Visit Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 Three zero nine zero three eight seven. That's one eight six six three zero nine zero three eight seven. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Now back to Ted Wallachin. So d- during all of this, p- people turn turn to uh, pets for for comfort and for care. Mm-hmm. When you were battling a cancer your first day and your second time, did you were you surrounded by animals at all? Your pets, dogs, cats, parakeets, anything? No, I didn't. Uh, no, I didn't have any animals, but I grew up with dogs, and I got a dog actually when I moved back to Toronto. And generally speaking, I. I like to objectify dogs a lot. There's only a certain type that I like. I like medium size. I like short haired. I don't like saliva dripping dogs. So I like a 50, <laughs> 60 pounder, you know. Um, but dogs are wonderful. Sounds you like you're, or- you're ordering a roast at long ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have to have the right tail, the good yeah. cheekbones, good shoulder blades, yeah. and 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 nice lips. I'm, I mean, and then got a good snout. So when if I'm walking down the street with my friends, they look at a dog and they go, "Is that your type?" I said, "Yeah, that's my type." Good, I thought so from your description. You okay. know, but the the little yappy ones, those little yappy dogs, I call them kennel swatches because they're just samples of what a dog could be. <laughs> But here, Ted, I got to prove to you that dogs are better than cats. Because have you ever seen a seeing eye cat? No, 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 that's a good point. They'd all be stuck in trees. That's good. That's true. That's true. I, I have a cat. I have to tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, oh, and okay. and and I. But I understand the difference. I've had dogs and I've had cats in my my entire life. And yeah, dogs. You 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 go go to the store. Come back five minutes later, the dog is treating you like you just came back from, from <laughs> Afghanistan in your third tour, right? 
They, <laughs> they have no idea how long a concept of time. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, oh, you're back, you're back, you're back. And they're jumping all over you and they're so happy. And but man, I've been gone five minutes. Your spouse should be that reactive, right? Yeah, it's your so cat, true. Your cat, you go away on a cruise for three weeks and you come back and go, oh, thank God you're back. We could use some new food. Yeah, except that the litter box is full of crapola. Yeah. Mine, mine doesn't use a litter box. Did mine you train it outside. to use the toilet? Oh. No, it goes outside. Okay, so you've got a little trap door and your house is uh, robbed while you're away for so long. Okay. No, we don't have a trap door. It's just it, he goes out when he needs to go out and that's it. How does he get out of the house, please? I let him out. Yeah, I'm I thought I thought that's when you're traveling. What do you do with the cat when you're gone? Oh no, when you're, when you're traveling, well, that, that's that's then somebody has to be here to let him in, let him out. Okay. Well, I've heard that cats get really resentful when their owners go away, and they can um, maybe pee on things. I've heard that rumor. Oh, some might, some might. Oh yeah, but, you you love your cat, baby. Okay. Well, he's he's very special. He sleeps. Right now. <laughs> well, a lot of people say, "No, my cat is so special. He's not like a cat. He's like a dog." I said, "Then just get a dog." <laughs> he's not like a dog at all. He's like a cat because he is a cat. <laughs> okay, you're the one of the few. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to put together some letters for him to figure out, you know, see if I can fit him into the LGBTQ cat thing. <laughs> So, you know what I've noticed? Uh, I've been getting older every year, and I've actually hit the point where I'm 65 and up. And so I had this big change in being covered medically. So some of my medication, I pay $4. And I went, now this is great, right? Yeah, 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 I know. So... But now I'm planning a trip to go away. I won't say where. I won't say when. I don't want my house robbed. But uh, I'm going away, and I wanted to buy a travel health insurance. And the prices for anybody 65 and over is astronomical. Oh, yeah. So how is that? One way you get something cheaper. The other way it's more expensive. And you know what? I didn't even realize I was that old until I walked into Shoppers Drug Mart on a Tuesday, and everybody, including the janitor, shouted out at me, it's not Thursday. <laughs> it's Thursday. It's, it's the, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, I think you can get a break <laughs> once you're like 55 or something. Yeah, it, but uh, let's see. Is that generally speaking? No, it's on Thursdays. It is on Thursdays. I don't I th- think generally you do. I, th- I think. I, I don't think you have to be 65 to be considered a senior Oh, at no, I know what you're thinking of. Shoppers Drug Mart, they were doing a 55. And yeah. then I think some of them changed it or something like that. I don't yeah. know. But um, uh, people say, well, how do you feel? Do you feel any different? I said, well, I can tell you. I, there's one thing that I've noticed, and I can describe getting older in one word. Leakage. <laughs> in Leakage. almost ev- every orifice in my body, except one. The one I may want to use for sex is bone dry. You know, I'm walking down the street and I can hear it squeaking and rubbing against each other. I've got sparks coming out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like, oh my God, you can't sneeze, you can't cough without having some protection. I mean, it's gotten so bad in my bladder. I've bought shares in Depends, you know. Mm. And uh, people actually ask me, I know why they call it Depends because people ask me, are you, are you wearing one? Uh-huh. Do, do you actually pee in your pants wearing your Depends? And I say, well, that depends. And that's how they said, that's how they came up with the name. I think so. I think so. Are you doing uh, any, any stand-up uh, lately, by the way? I do the occasional show. Uh, I did a show for a special Jewish audience. And, uh, and I put a couple of new jokes together for them about how Jews are really love Gentiles when they use one or two Jewish words. So is that true? (laughs) You know what? I tried that out on some Jewish people and they all go, it's true. It's true. It's it's like, (laughs) I know. It's like, if you say schlep or mashikana or shmata, I mean, we love you. It's like, we'll invite you out for dinner. You know, we'll have you over. I mean, just, you know, 
you had somebody came into you know the store the other day and said i just slept over here because i love get filter fish and i walked up and i said i've got to have you over for dinner this is amazing i mean you're gentile right and and you talk like that i, I just love you so I, I call them up and i say adolf can you come over for passover right and uh, doesn't matter what they've done doesn't matter who they are and then he says can i bring over himmler and i said oh no why do you want to bring himmler <laughs> and 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 wait, wait, wait. And Adolf said, well, he's my mishpocha. And I went, oh, damn. Okay, bring him too. Because mishpocha, <laughs> mishpocha means he's part of the family on the okay. extended side. So it's uh, like, then you got to bring them all over. It's like and, and my girlfriend came into the bedroom the other day and she said, honey, have you he seen my hair shmata? And this was two months after dating. Have you seen my hair shmata? I said, fuck, I got to marry you now. <laughs> we are suckers for Yiddish words from Gentiles. You'll it's, see. it's interesting because because in other cultures, uh, they get all all upset. It, it's, it's called a, you know cultural appropriation. Yeah, you know where you where you where you you know like it's like well, I guess I heard a guy. I, I can't remember who it was, but it doesn't matter. Uh, complaining, he says, you know, I went into this pizza place. That I used to eat eaten all the time, and and, and then and I moved, and I moved back, and I went to this my favorite pizza place, and and the owner sold it, and they sold it to these like um, East Indian guys. Dude, what right. the hell's an East Indian guy making pizza for? <laughs> I said, well, I said, did you try it? He said, yeah. I said, how was it? He said it was really good. Right. Exactly. Does it matter? Right. Who says you have to be Italian to make pizza? Oh, absolutely. It probably came from China, didn't everything. Yeah, well, that's what they say, right? Right, that's what yeah. they say. Indeed. But how's your sex life? My sex life? Yeah. It's football season. That's my sex life. Oh, God. And, and every wife is going, tell me about it. Yeah, well, I have to tell you, my sex life is is really questionable it, to the point where I I book gynecology appointments just to get some action up there. <laughs> I, I just keep calling. So I think I have another yeast infection. Another? Yeah, please. Can you come in? And get, can you just examine me? Because I got to tell you, I take those appointments very seriously. I shower. I get a mani, a pedi. I get a Brazilian wax. You know, like I want to look good for these things just because it's my outing. It's the only time I have to take off my clothes. That's an expensive proposition because the OHIP is not going to cover all those things just because you have to go to a medical <laughs> appointment. Well, okay, I've taken up S and M because uh, you have to do something different. You have to, you know, stir the pot a little bit. Yeah. So I've I've taken up S and M, and you know, I don't know if you've ever tried it, but uh, you have to have a safe word. Yeah. And um, my safe word is ouch. <laughs> yes, that's a, well, that works. Sure. Oh, you hear it all the time. <laughs> throughout my 30 minutes with the person I pay. Oh, you hear it all the time. Ouch, 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 ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Do you believe in reincarnation, Ted? I'm not sure. I, I thought about that the other day, and, and um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure that I, that I do, and, and I'm not sure. I, I think sometimes I, I convince myself that I want to be. I, I convince myself that it's true because I want it to be true. Because I don't want it to, to just end, end end. Yeah. Like I wanted want there to be a heaven or someplace where I can hang out with, with my old friends who are gone and family and stuff. And like there's gotta be something else. It can't just end. You know, like it'd be like like, like the Sopranos just ended. Didn't make any sense to me. Oh, I know. Oh my God. I heard they did a university course on the ending of the Sopranos. It was so uh, ambiguous. Like what did it really mean? Well, yeah. I, I was reading reincarnation. At, well, I was, I was reading about the animal kingdom actually. And I was thinking about reincarnation because I found out that lions have sex about 40 times a day. That's like 40. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. That sounds good. And a pig's orgasm lasts 20 minutes. So I know what I'm going to come back as. What? Well, which one would you choose um, out of the two? 
Well, 40 times a day. <laughs> mm-hmm. It seems to me like something is going to wear out. There you or, go. That, or that's or fall I'm... off or something. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. You've you helped me make saying? my decision. Now I, I, I know what I want. I want to be the pig. I think I want to be the pig, too. <laughs> We're going to yeah. stop eating bacon. That's all I know. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Anyway, I got to get going here. You got to get going. Uh, I thank you so much for, for chatting with us. Thanks very much for opening up. Um, you're always so honest, and, and that's what I love about you. And your- oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And the next time we talk, we can talk about cyclists on the roads and how they're taking over the city. Yeah. Oh. And Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi on the subway. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll wait to see that. And Air Canada and the vomit on the seats and making people sit on it. I can't wait to talk about those things. Too. Well, we'll do that next time we gather. You bet. Take care of yourself, Marla. You too, Ted. That'll do it for another episode, and we thank you again for joining us. Check out our sponsors. You can find uh, a link to them on our website, which is www.tedwalshen.ca. And if you uh, do drop by and visit Tom at Tom's place or call up uh, the folks at ETP Canada for some estate assistance, make sure that you uh, tell them that you heard about us right here, heard about them right here. You heard about us here because we're here. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, it's from www.tedwallison.ca. And while you're online, don't forget to fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallison Podcast has been brought to you by ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices. It's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Becky Coles. That's me. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. To talk to Ted and for more information on his podcast and our sponsors, go to www.tedwallishan.ca.